last time we were together, we talked about the current legal landscape that we find ourselves in as we worked to undertake systemic transformation for diversity, equity, and inclusion in STEM higher education, particularly around the consideration of race for enrollment. We talked about the three lanes and how the different lanes actually apply to what we can and cannot do. And we also talked about the fact that the court, the cases that are coming before the court have the potential of narrowing further or possibly removing our la third lane. So what can we continue doing? In what ways should we adjust what we are doing? So let me pick up on that, Shirley, if I can, and introduce a risk spectrum to help make concrete the kind of strategies and steps that institutions can consider in light of their evaluation of their um, institutional risk. And I'll start first with um, a reference back to the Supreme Court's action contemplated in the Harvard and UNC cases, which uh, Jamie addressed at length in our last session and focus our audience on the orange box, where the holistic consideration of race as one of many factors is considered contextually to better understand a person's life experiences, accomplishments, and promise. In this context, um, around this set of issues, uh, this is where the court has focused in the past and it's where the court is expected to focus with respect to both the Harvard and the UNC decision. The court's decision next term will tell us whether, in fact, this array of, of interests around this design in admissions, based on 40 years of precedent, can continue, and if so, under what conditions. And so while it's labeled a high-risk proposition, I want to remind us all of the quote that we lifted from um, the court last term, or um, in the last session, that uh, strict in theory is not fatal in fact. The University of Michigan, the University of Texas, and certainly as to the lower courts, Harvard and UNC, have prevailed by establishing evidence with respect to this very strict standard. If we move one step to the left from the high, um, we're going to look at the possibility of race exclusivity, the red box, which is certainly prohibited in admissions decision making and is very hard but may be viable in limited situations where um, it can be justified, such as in limited awards of financial aid. So that's um, the far end of the risk spectrum. If you go to the, the other end of the risk spectrum, traditional race neutral alternatives are in the minimal green zone. They include, for instance, first generation, socioeconomic, geographical diversity, and similar factors that represent authentic interests for institutions of higher education aside from mere racial composition, but that can meaningfully contribute to the racial and ethnic diversity that serves as a foundation for achieving the benefits of diversity for all students in the ways that we've been discussing. And then finally, in addition to the green strategies, we've got somewhere in the middle, a yellow cluster that we term race aware, but that we believe are likely legally neutral under court standards and therefore should survive whatever action, and we're not predicting the precise action, but whatever the action the court may take, should be still sustainable to and through those court's decisions. These yellow strategies involve more risk because they are explicitly race aware, but we think it's very likely that it should land in a moderate risk zone given their design as being legally neutral in the way, at least thus far, the court has defined neutral versus conscious in the race neutral, race conscious conscious spectrum. Tell us a bit more about race aware. The, the reason I ask is that within the sciences and, and innovation space, we know of situations where not taking risk, race into account has in fact led us to bad outcomes in terms of the design of technologies. So I want to know a little bit more about this issue, this space of race aware where we can begin to navigate uh, some of the things that we may not have thought about before. 
So Shirley, as I mentioned in our first um, first segment of this inter- this two part interview, federal non discrimination law generally does not regulate race and ethnicity as a subject matter. We teach we teach courses on on uh, on race uh, explicitly and 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 have seminars and and gatherings uh, on race. So those kinds of things are not. The subject race as a subject matter is not something that generally is is uh, regulated by federal non-discrimination law, and neither is diversity and equity um, as an aim alone. You can be explicit that your aim is to increase participation and success of students of color in your educational programs. You can be explicit about having racial equity aims. It's when the bare racial status of an individual is considered as an entry requirement, which is race exclusivity, that that red box that Art was showing, or when race is a factor among many, which is race consciousness, that orange box that the court is focusing on right now, in conferring benefits as the means to achieve the diversity and equity aims that federal non-discrimination law imposes strict standards that govern both the aims which, which um, generally are educational benefits of diversity for all students and the means of achieving them, the strategies and policies that you use to achieve those aims. When wisely strategizing, there is a considerable room um, to move within this space around how to consider race with authenticity and a focus on subject matter and student experience. We've devised what we call race aware as an approach that has not been reviewed by the Supreme Court, but we think it is likely to be treated as neutral. And it has been useful in my experience actually using it at several institutions in their undergraduate enrollment programs, including um, uh, scholarship mentoring and enrichment programs. Um, The University of California at Berkeley and other UC institutions have used a similar approach in faculty hiring. There is a different legal regime that applies to faculty and staff employment that we're not really addressing today, as opposed to the student education context that we are talking about. But there are some core race aware but neutral qualities that institutions value and that can be useful in both contexts. There are three criteria. Um, Each is distinct and all are complementary, but no one person needs to satisfy all three because each one is highly valuable. First is a person's deep knowledge and awareness of issues of race in society, education, or particular fields. This knowledge may be gained from personal experience of race in society, from intentional and highly dedicated learning, not just the course you had to take in high school, or from serious service to communities of color, not just the public service hours you needed to graduate. Second is a person's strong record of commitment to ameliorate issues of racial and ethnic injustice in society, education, or certain fields. This can be demonstrated by a person's long service to communities and commitments to additional service. And third is demonstrated success in engaging on issues of race and ethnicity and elevating others' understanding. This can be demonstrated by activities and actions, including mentoring or planning and contributing to tough discussions on issues of race and ethnicity for learning. All of these criteria are on qualities that are critical for reaping educational diversity benefits for all students, as well as for advancing equity. In this strategy, no individual's racial or ethnic status is considered in conferring benefits. Only individual's knowledge, commitment, or experience around issues of race is considered. But due to societal racism, without any race-based differential treatment by an institution, a high proportion of students of color are likely to fare well under these criteria. While the criteria will not address all important aspects of racial or ethnic diversity, Very similar to traditional neutral strategies, they should meaningfully contribute. Some white students are also likely to fare well under these criteria, but they will be proven allies who advance more welcoming and inclusive climate and culture at an institution. And building a welcoming climate and culture will translate into greater barrier removal, retention, and success for students of color too. If this race-aware approach is authentically and consistently applied, we think it's very likely to be legally sustainable whatever the Supreme Court decides in the pending cases. 
and using this approach now would also contribute to the evidence you must assemble under current law to justify individual race consciousness in selecting students. It will be part of the evidence that you are seriously considering and using race neutral strategies and can help to demonstrate that those strategies are not alone enough um, with evidence that demonstrates that. We are trying within the Sea Change Initiative to make sure that institutions are aware of a lot of these kinds of things that they can do uh, that might be race aware that would kind of help them to continue to support diversity, equity, and inclusion. And the application of the resources within diversity and the law would be a way to, to move forward uh, with a lot of this work. Yes, that's, that's absolutely right, Shirley. See, as you, I mean, obviously, as you know, Sea Change provides institutions with a tool and a process. It helps them to make evidence-based decisions about how to advance diversity and equity in a way that's both effective and legally sustainable. It also guides institutions to create and implement a management system led by multi-office collaborative teams that include legal advisors. And th those teams can assess um, and access existing data and conduct an ongoing data-rich self-assessment process that identifies barriers, including those that relate to conduct, climate, and culture. And they, that can actually help them to design programs that remove those barriers that are specific to the institution in order to, do, to advance both diversity and equity. This sea change scaffolding is like a fast lane on that long journey down the DEI highway. Sea change can help an institution to satisfy current legal requirements by demonstrating an institution, an institution's own evidence, not just their opinion, that neutral strategies have been evaluated and modeled for their feasibility and effectiveness and have been implemented, but that in many cases, neutral strategies are not alone enough. Evidence often shows that, um, that what is needed is really a combination of limited race consciousness to create sufficient um, diverse, diverse settings along with the neutral strategies that contribute to those diverse settings for all students to fully participate as individuals and engage with a wide diversity of students and, and other people um, as they are um, in, in their learning uh, process. Sea change also focuses on identifying and removing barriers for, for people of color and removal of barrier, barriers, particularly affecting some races without depriving any race of material benefits is very likely to be regarded as legally inclusive. Different legal regimes, as I said, apply to student education and faculty and staff employment, but barrier removal can contribute consequentially to enhancing diversity and equity in the student and employment contexts while also helping to justify race consciousness under both legal regimes when possible. Um, you mentioned the Diversity in the Law 2021 project that Art and I and, and you, Shirley, and other colleagues were working on, um, at, which is funded by the Sloan Foundation and, and that we all inter, um, engaged in together. And, and, and the, 20, uh, the constellation of 20 resources that we've developed that are really aimed at policymakers, program designers, and legal advisors, and that focus on what can be done now and in the future. Um, these resources cover both students and faculty and staff, and they're available for free on the AAAS website. Erin, um, I think, is, is providing a, a link. Um, and they include a step-by-step -step guide, um, a set of guides, and diagrams for designing diversity and equity initiatives. There's one set for students and another set for faculty and staff. They also include neutral strategy guides, again, with one set for, the, for students, another for faculty and staff. And, and, and all of these guides include examples of the knowledge and commitment race-aware strategies that we've been talking about. We also have templates for creating that multi-office management system. Um, templates for DEI statements and application related questions so that you can learn about how individuals can contribute to knowledge, uh, commitment, and experience. And then single issue and more comprehensive guidance on the law and key definitions. We also have, I think, something that's really important for policymakers and lawyers alike, which is a chart of relevant research sources. And in depth, and, and there's an in depth legal handbook uh, for lawyers. I like to call it the legal encyclopedia. 
During the development process, we vetted a number of these resources with the seven Sea Change members that participated in the curriculum, and we're very grateful to them for their engagement, which really informed the documents. In addition to these resources, um, we'd like to leave you with this bottom line. This is a time for institutions to maintain a strong commitment to diversity and to equity, and not to be intimidated by the legal landscape. It is also a time for institutions to act wisely without bravado. That means continuing to pursue diversity and equity programs with awareness and fealty to current law, including paying attention to workable race neutral strategies as well as race conscious strategies when supported by evidence of need. Importantly, by including a focus on traditional neutral strategies as well as race aware but neutral strategy, but legally neutral strategies at this time right now, they, which are likely to also be sustainable contributors later, an institution will be well positioned to continue its commitment to diversity and equity, whatever the future may bring. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Art. We are very happy to have been able to bring these conversations to you. It is critical for those of us within science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medicine to be able to continue to pursue the diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies that are legal and that can are legally sustainable because it is central to a realization that diversity is central to excellence in STEM. That's why we as AAAS are interested in making sure that you are aware that there are things that you can do and that there are th things that you can support in order to be responsive to the need to create an environment that is inclusive and welcoming. Thank you. <music>